At this point in your training, you have already interpreted hundreds of ECGs and understand the basic principles and usage of the ECG. This section, which will appear in two parts with 10 ECGs each, will review these basic principles and then move on to more subtle electrocardiographic findings likely to appear on the boards. As with most things in medicine, it is more useful to reason rather than to memorize, and we will emphasize this reasoning process here. For each case, you will be shown an ECG and given a brief patient history. You can then pause the program to jot down your initial impressions before listening to the description of the ECG. In this way, you can test your knowledge of ECGs and identify any problem areas as you study. Knowing how to read a normal ECG is even more important than understanding an abnormal one, because if you know what an ECG should look like, you'll know how to spot something wrong. This tracing, which is normal, will serve to illustrate some basic points of electrocardiography. There are two important steps in ECG interpretation. First, run a quick mental checklist in your head. Rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, R-wave progression, QRS morphology, and STT waves. Then, remember to sit back and put together your findings with a clinical context. What have you learned about this patient? Did you find what you were looking for? This is an ECG from a 63-year-old man with diabetes who presented for a routine clinic visit. It demonstrates sinus bradycardia at a rate of 50 beats per minute. The rhythm is sinus because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the P waves and the QRS, and because P wave morphology and axis is normal, upright in the inferior leads. This tells you that atrial depolarization originates high in the right atrium, in the sinus node, and travels in a downward direction towards the feet. The QRS axis is normal, upright in leads 1 and 2. The intervals are normal. A normal PR interval indicates rapid conduction through the AV node. A narrow QRS indicates that ventricular depolarization is occurring via the AV node and that the conduction system is healthy without bundle branch block. R wave progression is normal, with the RS transition occurring between V3 and V4. This transition is the point at which the R wave becomes taller than the S wave is deep. When this occurs early, with R greater than S in V1 or V2, you should think about RVH, posterior infarct, or simply counterclockwise rotation of the heart. When the R wave progression is delayed, consider anterior MI, pulmonary disease, or clockwise rotation. Next, look for Q waves. A significant or pathological Q wave is one that is at least one small box wide and at least a quarter to a third the height of the R wave. Smaller Q waves may represent septal depolarization. These are normal and are generally seen in the lateral leads, 1, L, V5, and V6, because the septum normally depolarizes from left to right. Of note, an isolated Q wave in lead 3, even if it is large, can be a normal finding. Q in 3 is free. There are no pathologic Q waves in this tracing. When looking for ST segment depression or elevation, use the TP segment as your isoelectric baseline. The TP segment is the area between the end of one QRS complex's T wave and the beginning of the next P wave. This is the only time during which no electrical activity is occurring, and therefore it should not move unless there is motion ar artifact. Compare this TP segment to the first 80 milliseconds of the ST segment, starting with the J point, the junction between the QRS and ST. Pick a lead where this J point is most easily identified. When possible, make things easy for yourself. In general, ST depression is caused by ischemia, non-transmural infarction, or digoxin effect, or LVH with repolarization abnormalities, while ST elevation is caused by acute transmural injury, which will evolve into a Q wave infarction if left untreated, or Prinz metals angina, vasospasm, pericarditis, or LV aneurysm. This is an important point. ST depression, think ischemia. ST elevation, think injury. A benign cause of ST elevation is so-called early repolarization, which is usually best seen and leads V1 to V4 and is common in young men, particularly athletes. There are no ST segment deviations in this patient's ECG. The T waves in this tracing are normal. T wave changes when present are nonspecific and can accompany any number of clinical scenarios. For example, peaked or hyperacute T waves are seen in acute ischemia or hyperkalemia. Inverted T waves may be seen during the evolution of a Q wave infarction or pericarditis. T wave inversions can also be seen with LV or RV strain or in the setting of a major stroke. This tracing was taken from the same patient one year later on presentation to the emergency room with the acute onset of dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain. 
Take a close look and compare to the prior baseline ECG. What do you see? First of all, there's sinus tachycardia. Second, there's new rightward axis deviation and incomplete right bundle branch block. Third, there is now T-wave inversion noted across the precordium V1 to V4. The leads V1 to V4 overlie the anterior surface of the heart, which can be the anterior wall of the LV, or is in this case the right ventricle. These T-wave inversions and right axis deviation represent acute RV strain. This gentleman suffered a massive pulmonary embolism. This tracing was taken from a 67-year-old man who presented with severe chest pain lasting five hours. What do you notice? The most striking abnormality is ST elevation in leads V1 to V5, greatest in lead V4, 4 to 5 millimeters. This is the most worrisome finding and suggests acute current of injury across the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Now look at R-wave progression across the precordium. You'll see that the R-wave actually gets smaller as you go from V2 to V4 with Q-waves in V3, V4, and V5. This suggests that the infarct is partially completed with loss of voltage from the anterior wall due to myocardial death and resulting electrical silence. The other significant finding is Q-waves in the inferior leads, suggesting a prior inferior infarct. ST segments are normal in these leads, suggesting that this is a completed event. The timing of the IMI cannot be determined. It could be days, months, or years old. What would you expect to find on cardiac catheterization? This patient had an old occlusion of the RCA, accounting for the IMI, and thrombotic recent occlusion of the LAD, accounting for the evolving anterior MI. This is a 65-year-old woman with dyslipidemia and diabetes presenting for a routine office visit. What abnormality do you see? The rhythm is normal sinus. The axis and intervals are within normal limits. R-wave progression, however, is very abnormal. There are Q-waves from V1 to V4 with essentially no R-wave until V4. This suggests a completed transmural anteroseptal infarction. As in the preceding case, the leads V1 to V4 overlie the anterior wall of the left ventricle, and these changes are consistent with an LAD territory infarct. In addition, there is nonspecific T-wave flattening in V4 to V6.